Welcome back to Wheeler Scientific. This video will use a previously produced reagent to produce hexachloropropene, which will then be used to produce uranium tetrachloride. The reaction is an elimination reaction known as E2, a fundamental organic reaction. In the reaction, chlorine is kicked off and a new double bond is formed. To accomplish this, we will use a strong base to remove a hydrogen group from the polychlorinated aliphatic hydrocarbon. In this case, our previously produced heptachloropropane. I produced heptachloropropane, a polychlorinated aliphatic hydrocarbon, in our previous video. Let's explain what all that means. Polychlorinated means that multiple chlorines are attached. Aliphatic means an open chain compound that is either straight or branched with carbon. And a hydrocarbon simply means that a compound contains carbon and hydrogen that are bonded together. The chemicals needed for this reaction are calcium hydroxide, hydrochloric acid, sodium bicarbonate, and the previously produced heptachloropropane. A few variations can be made between solvent and base, such as sodium hydroxide instead of calcium hydroxide, or water and methanol as a solvent. The reason why I will use calcium hydroxide in this case is to lower the chance of a thermal reaction from occurring. Strong bases such as potassium and sodium hydroxide are known for causing thermal runaways. This reaction is quite temperature sensitive, so we need to maintain proper temperature ranges. And by using a less strong base, we can maintain temperatures better. To begin, 33 grams of calcium hydroxide is added to a 500 milliliter flask, along with 150 milliliters of deionized water. Next, 110 grams of hexachloropropane is added. The hexachloropropane is melted in a water bath and made sure that it's fluid before addition. The molten heptachloropropane is poured into the flask. A reflex condenser is then placed on top and the hot plate is brought to 90 degrees Celsius and stirring is increased. The calcium hydroxide is in excess to the hexachloropropane. This means the reaction will always be in a basic solution, driving the reaction to completion. In chemistry, when one reagent is used up first, it's known as the limiting reagent. In our case, that is the heptachloropropane. The reaction occurring here is the classic E2 reaction. The hydroxide ion grabs onto the hydrogen, ripping it off. At this point, electrons swing in, forming a double bond while kicking off the chlorine, because only four bonds can be attached to a carbon. The chlorine then reacts with the calcium ion, forming calcium chloride. There are exceptions to the four bond carbon rule, but those occur at very weird situations and under normal conditions rarely occur. This style of E2 reaction occurs at elevated temperature, in our case, a 90 degrees Celsius one. Pushing the temperature too hot will cause other chlorines to get ripped off and different reactions to take place, keeping it too cold and no reaction will take place. The reaction reflux was ran for about 6 hours. At that point, it was allowed to cool back down to room temperature. Hydrochloric acid is then added until all leftover calcium hydroxide reacts to form calcium chloride. At this point, two distinctive layers form. The bottom layer is our product, hexachloropropene. We know this due to the density. To separate the layers, we'll use a separatory funnel. We transfer the product layer into another separatory funnel and then wash the product with sodium bicarbonate solution. And this is to remove any leftover acid and any water soluble impurities. We then do a final washing with water. The hexachloropropene is then transferred to a storage vessel with molecular sieves to keep it dry. The product is quite cloudy due to water being present, but after a few days, while drying, it's nice and clear. I then filtered off the hexachloropropene and added new sieves to keep it dry.
the yield was 76.60 grams. Overall, this is a relatively simple method for producing hexachlorpropene, which I will use in the following video to produce uranium tetrachloride. That's it. You can stop watching the video now. No, don't look at the timestamp. Okay, now that all the normies are gone, we can dive into some organic chemistry methods. Okay, how do I even know what I made here is what I made? Let's prove it. In chemistry, you have what are known as spectroscopic instrumental methods. This is where you use different instruments to examine a chemical compound. If you are common in the lab, these are NMR, FTIR, and GC mass spec. First things first, we went from a material that was solid at room temperature to something that is now liquid at room temperature which shows a chemical change has occurred. One could use a melting point apparatus to determine if it's in the expected range, but I do not have one that goes into low temperature melting point. First off, FTIR. FTIR is Fortier Transfer Infrared Spectroscopy, which uses infrared spectrum to create data based on absorption and transmission of IR light. Different bonds and groups have their different absorption values. A common one that is easily discernible is OH group which leaves a broad band and broad peak at 300 centimeters to the negative one. Knowing which group and which bonds leave what peaks, one can tell what chemical has been tested. A sample of our reactant, heptachloropropane, is tested first to compare the reaction. The data outputted by the IR is known as a spectrum. The first one is at 3002, which corresponds to a CH bond. Then moving forward, we see peaks in the 600-800 range. These are the chlorine-carbon bonds. Another thing that we can do with this is to compare it to a known spectrum done on a pure sample. We see that they are quite similar and match up quite well. A few peaks are off, which can be due to many reasons, such as different calibrations or my instrument just being a cheap one. Running the product, we quickly notice that no peak around 3000 shows the hydrogen and carbon bond disappearing. Then comparing it to a known spectrum, it matches again, showing us that a reaction took place. Now on to nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR. It works by exploiting magnetic properties of certain atomic nuclei, particularly those with odd numbers of protons and neutrons, such as hydrogen-1 and carbon-13. These nuclei align with or against a strong magnetic field. When radio frequency pulses are applied, they temporarily disrupt this alignment and the nuclei returns to its original state. They emit a signal that can be detected and analyzed to reveal information about the molecular structure and environment of the molecule. With the unit I have, I can both do hydrogen and carbon NMR. I filled each NMR tube up with a sample and used deuterated chloroform as the solvent. First, I ran hydrogen one, only needing around 16 scans to fully resolve each sample. Now the heptochloropropane has a hydrogen in the compound, which does appear in the NMR spectrum. But something weird happens when I run the hexachloropropene, in which hydrogen appeared also. This shouldn't happen as the structure has no hydrogen in it, therefore no hydrogen should show up. But to confirm my suspicions, I ran a carbon-13 NMR, which needs over 16,000 scans at 3.65 seconds to fully resolve. Because of the rarity of carbon-13 only making up 1% of all the carbons, this scan takes a while to resolve, so I ran it overnight. Comparing the two, what happened quickly becomes apparent. Some heptachloropropane remains unreacted and remains in the final product. With NMR, even small amounts of the sample will show up. This won't affect any further reactions I will do. If I were to do this project over again, I would allow the reflux to take longer so the reaction could complete. I would have loved to do a GCMS spec sample on this, but I ran out of time for this project. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed.